got into this because I was working as a fine artist, painting and sculpture mostly, and noticing the huge effects and the huge influence that our machines have on us and that most people don't recognize on a daily basis as they go through their lives the actual huge influence that our machines are having on us. And um, as we're co-evolving, making our worlds with them. So I wanted to make machines that point some of that out. And I, I don't have a clicker. Is that your clicker there? Oh, maybe. Just hopefully. Um, is that going? So I brought some of those machines to share with you today, and we will have time after the, these, these talks to um, you work with them. Um, before I get into the first machine, I just wanted to offer this as a uh, way to think about how, how easy and fluid it is for us to be influenced by our machines and take on qualities of mar our machines. So borrowing from developmental psychology and social theory, actually whenever we interact with something in the world, we are learning also about ourselves. When um, you come into contact with somebody or a thing or a machine, you are, without you being consciously aware of it, learning from it, th things to identify about your own place in the world too, your own voice, where, where your boundaries are, where you begin and end. What, you, what is your agency in, your, in the world? What are you meant to be doing? Um, how are you gonna use your voice to make change in the world? So we go around, we find these things and they, we incorporate in th them into us all the time. So it's important as designers of machines to also know that when we're putting these things out into the world, from our own experiences, they're, they're gonna be, then it behooves us to think about all of the effects of them, not just the purpose for which they were made, not just the described, prescribed function of the machine, um, because it's just going, keep, keeps on going. And artists and designers are rigorously trained to think about not only what, what is in front of them, what is the thing, not only what is a thing supposed to be or expected to be, a car makes us go faster, but it's also, they are also trained to see and think about what else is there, what are all the side things that are going on, what is actually in front of them. So I think it's really important to include artists and designers in the development and um, thinking about what are the new technologies that are gonna be changing and forming our cultures and our worlds. So the first machine I'm gonna show you is from, it's fine. <laughs> it's from a series of this is one is for teenagers. It's from a series of um, wearable body organs, which were, I was noticing in the late 90s, everyone was starting to have cell phones and PDAs and things that would you know, extend their memory, but at the same time, they were forming dependence on them so that they actually would forget where their kids were or what time they were supposed to pick them up if they didn't have their PDA. So, and, and all the, there were like lots of different versions of the same kind of memory extension or contact and contactability extension of cell phones. And I was thinking, how about a wearable device that is addressing a different kind of human need, one that is not mass marketed to, but that is still really uh, important and important to discuss about. Um, so I made Screen Body. Um, Do you ever find yourself in a situation where you really have to scream, but you can't because you're at work, or you're in a classroom, or you're watching your children, or you're in any number of situations where it's just not permitted? Well, Scream Body is a portable space for screaming. When the user screams into Scream Body, their scream is silenced. But it is also recorded for later release, where, when, and how the user chooses. The 
The main body of screen body is constructed of open cell polyurethane foam with a latex barrier around that. These two together act to absorb and contain the sound of the screen. On the outside, there are two conductive switches, one for recording on the top and one for playing back on the bottom. They're made of two layers of copper separated by an insulating layer of rubber with holes cut into it. As the squeeze switch is squeezed, the layers of copper will come in contact and the switch will be closed. I will play back a screen for you. It goes on, and if you want to learn how to make your own, the rest of the video is online, and it tells you how to make the circuit and stuff. Um, so key to its design was that it was socially visible. I didn't want it to be hidden, um, but I wanted it to be, you know, imagine making hundreds or thousands of these and having people wear them around and use them in public spaces so that not only was it being a useful device for them, but that it was making a social performance about this aspect of the human condition and this uh, need. Um, and also, I met, uh, for me and what I hope it would be for people is sort of a training, like an in-between device, a nice coach for a while. So for a while, you use it as a safe in-between place to experience your voice and get comfortable using it freely. And after a while, you would no longer need it. You could just express yourself freely without it. I think there's a screen. There's a screen. But you guys, you guys can try it. But please come try it after. It feels really good. <laughs> so it's like a, it's kind of like an armor you can wear. Um, and there are some other projects in this series. The one on the top right is uh, an inflatable holding, self-administered holding jacket. It's almost like a self-administered straitjacket. But if you needed to be held, uh, comforted in that way, you could blow, uh, have that ex uh, inflated. And um, I'm on a boat, so also it's useful if you're on a boat. <laughs> um, so at the same time as I was developing this, the screen body, the portable space for screaming, I was walking down the street one day, and um, there was a road construction site, and someone was jackhammering. And I was like, hey, that's, that's a space for screaming, too. So I stood kind of near, nearby, kind of minded my own business. And then when the person started jackhammering, I would scream. And no one noticed because I was hidden. I was held in the sound of the jackhammer. And then I was like, oh, OK, let me try, try this with other machines. And then I would start going to construction sites. And I would go a lot to the Big Dig, which was this big contested highway project in Boston. And I would try to make sounds with the machines. And what I soon found out is that a lot of the machines had tonal qualities. And I could actually get into vocal resonance with the machines and not be able to separate where my voice ends and theirs begins. So I would sometimes be having this hallucination that I was actually driving the machine with my voice, kind of. And sometimes they would pull me along to make expressions um, and vocalizations that I would have never otherwise been occasion to make an experience. And some of them were really evocative and interesting and not a verbal kind of thing. So I was like, this is kind of like another, you know, there's dance therapy and art therapy. So this is like another kind of, of, of self-study here. So I started bringing other people to the site. The, <laughs> <laughs> the construction workers would tell me, they were into me coming, and they would tell me as we went, to find different machines and the tunnels and everything. OK, don't tell the other guys, but uh, I, I sing with the machines all the time, too. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so they go, OK, I want to do something. So I started holding these sessions at the, at the construction sites and then also with smaller indoor machines and domestic appliances. <laughs> so, yeah. so this is one of a, an early machine therapy session. This was, well, it was an old mortar and pestle machine from a chem lab at MIT from way long ago. It was all cast iron and ceramic and even some wooden parts. And uh, I would kind of help the person get into vocal and physical relationship with the machine. And, um, and then I started building machines that would um, actually respond back, not just you would kind of 
think you might be having some effect on the crane, but that they actually would be responsive with you and they would be a, par a partner in discovering some stuff with you. So the first one um, is a blender, oh, which I also brought here. But I'll play the video. So, you know, so human machine communication is usually thought of as a, as a coded language. It's a system of signals, signs that we consciously navigate, train, and, and use. Um, and these, this human machine uh, communication is instead based on body based things. So, you actually have to make the sound of the blender. And, um, also was interested in interface design and how much our interfaces often distance us from like some pretty serious stuff that's happening. You know, even with your blender at home, a nice cozy example, uh, if you have a child or a cat, you might know that babies will cry and cats will run and hide under the bed because actually this violent sound is going on and you're pressing a button that says pulverize and whip <laughs> and uh, just making your smile. So anyway, I'm going to try this, but we didn't have time to test it. So okay. <laughs> so you guys come hang out with it after. <laughs> so oh, with this, we're looking at the, the roughness. So you have to have the sound of a blender between 30 and 80 hertz. We're looking at the dominant pitch. So the blender tries to empathize with you and go the same speed so that its motor sound will mostly match yours. It's like a nice, empathetic bartender, too. And uh, we're looking at timber, all the sound that isn't in the dominant pitch and the power, just like how loud you are. And I wanted to think about, so if I'm a machine therapist, and I have an office full of you know, machines, like a vacuum cleaner and a drill and all these other machines, the machines need to be able to tell which one the person is talking to. Because to, to us, we, we can kind of know, we have an idea of what the machine sounds like, and we think we get really close, but to, um, a computer doing digital signal processing on our sound. Actually, we don't sound much like a machine at all. So we had to train a model, and I worked with a couple of acoustic scientists to train a, mo a machine model that would be able to know um, which a machine of five a person is trying to talk to. And we used recordings from machine therapy sessions. So I think this is someone sounding like a drill. <laughs> I 
that part and say, like when the, when the drill gets stuck. Um, and then this is a vacuum cleaner. And a sewing machine. And so, only with eight people in our in our sampling in our samples, we still got it, the machine model to do 50, actually 100% better uh, at detecting when a person <laughs> is talking to it, which is still only 40%. But you know, there's room for growth. And then the next um, series of projects that I'm working on now are I'm calling them companion projects, and they are in response to a lot of these companion robots that we are seeing now coming out for um, healthcare, companionship, uh, uh, lo like loneliness. Um, this is a nurse. Uh, this is also a nurse, and that's a CMU grad student dressed up like an old person. <laughs> this is uh, the first gender-recognizing robot that can kiss. <laughs> um, and this is a baby learning about the world and its own self in the world with its relationship with its Ibo. And I was thinking about how uh, it, it struck me that they were all whole pretending to be sentient cr creatures. They were all with eyes, with cameras in them. They all were kind of humanoid or animal-like. Um, and I was thinking about how, actually, but with everything, we have this relationship where we're learning about ourselves and we're, we're taking things on and, and having relationships. So I started to design machines that could be therapeutic, but um, weren't always so normatizing. They weren't always trying to soothe you, and they weren't always behaving well. So I wanted them to have a little bit of neuroses, too. I know anyway, when I was a kid and I would act up, my grandmother, I think, appreciated a little bit of extra interest that had. So I started these. So there are three in the series so far. The first one is AMO, and it's um, an electromagnetically radiating machine. That's, its electromagnetic field is modeled to be like a human heart in different psychological states. So if you're meditating, you're into heartbeat variation, your signal's pretty smooth, and if you're really stressed out, it's not. So I'm trying to see if people holding this machine in different states will, will actually somehow affect their state, even though there's no other signal on it, like there's no heartbeat, there's no other sign with it about what's going on. And if it does turn out that it has some kind of communication with them, then that is a hugely important thing to think about, because all of our machines, most of our machines, are, are emitting an electromagnetic field. Um, another one is a, uh, a machine that's kind of purring. So I thought about this because my cat used to sit on me and purr, and it was the most wonderful thing. And I was thinking about how also a lot of machines purr, and people take their kids for rides in cars to get them to fall asleep. And I used to go do my homework in the laundromat, because it <laughs> made me feel calm. So I was thinking that. Uh, Having a machine that's kind of always listening to its environment, which might be you if you're holding it close, or it might be <coughs> the whole space, um, and developing its own voice that's kind of a purr. That'd be cool. So I think there's some purrs here. Oh, that's the cat purring. This is a truck. Oh, these are the, have you guys met the laughing ducks out around the back? There are the, there's this, this stream, this, and these ducks that quack like that, they're laughing, they're so funny. They're going on. So, and then the last one I want to talk to you about is the one I brought, and I hope you all can hold it. It's Omo, and it's a breathing machine. As you hold it, it um, it's, it's feeling your subtle changes of pressure against it as you're breathing, and it's determining your breath envelope your periodicity, your phase, and it's thinking its own breathing, it's breathing too, to you. Um, and then it can think about how, it is, how you're breathing. Are you breathing really shallowly? Are you hyperventilating? Are you not breathing? Are you, uh, 
exhaling too quickly or something, and it'll slowly, while staying in train to you, change its own breathing so that you, as you're holding it, slowly change with it. Um, like, much like when you hold another person, you, you start breathing together. So here's a, a video, and then I'll get the thing. Animals and other living and even non-living things are affected by what are often overlooked side aspects of machines. Aspects including sound, movement, vibration, heat, electromagnetic radiation, and others that are byproducts or subconsciously included elements outside the consciously designed functions of the machines. Current companion robots are being designed to mimic whole animal or humanoid forms and to survey and medicate, often with their interaction scenarios predominantly focused on conscious behavior. Companion robots call us to ponder what caring may become. Oh, now it's really breathing. Omo, in contrast, is closer to a part and interactions with it are often subconscious. Omo is not a perfectly behaving companion, but rather has neuroses and surprises. Omo is a relational machine that interacts through the visceral and emotional arena of breath. The inner mechanical assembly and hardware of Omo actuate the expansion and contraction of the vessel in response to the patterns and shapes of breathing detected by an array of sensitive quantum tunneling composite compression sensors developed for Omo's soft rubber interface. In this early image, you can see the first prototype hardware of Omo before it was integrated into the embedded boards within the machine. The sensors developed for Omo are so responsive as to be able to pick up even tiny variations in pressure occasioned by the breathing of a person's torso against Omo. Pattern recognition and analysis software running on the main board of OMO investigate the breath periodicity and envelope of a person breathing so that OMO may develop an informed interaction. Hi. Do you want to have a go with baby? Big baby? Small baby. Well, however you want. Can I play on this navel? Um, like, you don't like to have your navel play, but I don't think it's... <laughs> oh, it is moving. It's breathing. out. Um, I also found that if I put it on the washing machine, it gets entrained to the, the movement of the cycle of the washing machine. So while there's not yet a market for machines that counsel other machines, we don't know. <laughs> maybe coming. Um, so this one, I guess I'll, maybe you can see it if I put it here. But please come try it on the break, too. I think it's breathing now. Is it breathing? Um, so while a lot of devices extend our abilities, um, give us some superpowers, they also make us sometimes give, we start having a dependence on them um, and hand over agency to them psychologically and materially. Um, and I'm trying to build machines in contrast that um, can enhance our own awareness and, and, and use of our own human abilities and um, at, after a while, like a good coach or a great conductor, the person might not need them, and they will have learned that aspect within themselves, and that will be good. <laughs>